Good morning. <clears throat> We're on Jeremiah chapter 14. Yesterday we were only able to uh, to deal with one verse because I preached a lot. We may get through with Jeremiah 14 today. Um, I need to move along quickly. But I'm glad you're with me today. God bless you. Yesterday, Jeremiah is pleading with God because God is judging Israel. They're in the stage of the famine and the pestilence, the drought, but the sword is coming upon them soon. Jeremiah is begging God not to do it, but God will not change his mind, even though God has told Jeremiah that he's not going to change his mind. God has explained himself, which he doesn't do a lot, but he explained himself to Jeremiah and thereby to us. Verse 19, yesterday, Jeremiah pleads with God. He said, hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Are you throwing us over? Are you giving us up? <laughs> hath thy soul loathed Zion? God has spent chapter after chapter saying how he hates what they're doing. And he hates them. He's going to remove them out of the land. He is going to remove them out of his sight according to their curses. In Deuteronomy. He's going to get them out of there. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Yes. God has already explained that he has utterly rejected Judah. Hath thy soul loathed Zion? Yes. He loathed Zion. And why? Because his wife had become a whore and she's committing adultery with other gods. Israel was picked as his wife, his chosen he took her in the time of love, and she became a wife to him, and he was a great provider. But then she sought her lovers on every corn floor. Yeah, so low Zion, his own people, because they had sinned. They had broken the Abrahamic covenant. They had broken the Palestinian covenant or the covenant of the land. They had broken the Mosaic Covenant, which had to do with the spiritual law of Israel. Hath thou so loathed Zion? Yes. Yes, it had, because they had sacrificed their children to Molech, because they baked cakes and offered sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven because they offered sacrifices to Baal and worshipped him and got down on their knees and worshipped the golden calves and the bulls of the fertility gods and the Ashtaroths, and the god of their rim fam, the god of their star rim fam. They, they loved all this stuff. They loved all these other gods. He loathed Zion. They pretended to worship God. They would go through their sacrifices and God says, I, they stink. I don't want them. And they said they offered their burnt offerings and their meat offerings and their meal offerings. And he said, I, I'm not going to eat of them. They stink. They're not a sweet savor. I don't want them. You're doing them for yourself so you can have a big party. You go ahead and eat and leave me out of it. They believed the false prophets. They said, God won't destroy Jerusalem because the temple is here. There'll be peace, but there was no peace. They kept on with their religious pretending and then their prophets and their priests prophesied unto them lies. God loathed Zion. 
Jeremiah says, why hast thou smitten us? And there is no healing in us. <laughs> I've smitten you for all your sins and all your rebellions and all your whoring after other gods and all your idolatries and your adulteries, your fornications, your perversions, your thefts, your lies, your greed. I judged you for all of them. That's why. And there's no healing. I offered you healing. Oh, no, but Lord, you said you're going to destroy Jerusalem no matter what. God remind that doesn't at this point, but he has reminded Jeremiah and Judah that anyone who will could come to him. It's a, it's a version. It's a, an old covenant version of whosoever will. <laughs> whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, I'm not going to save this city. It is falling to the sword. It is being led into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. I am not going to, to, to free the nation. I'm going to destroy the land. I'm going to remove you from the land. I'm going to take you captive. I'm going to kill a lot of you by the sword and by pestilence and by famine in the meantime. But. If any of you individual people will come to me, return to me. You can stay on your own land and you can eat from your own fruit, drink from your own well. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. And I won't take you into captivity. All you got to do is come back to me and worship me in spirit and in truth instead of pretending to worship me while you worship other gods and relish and revel Relish your sin and revel in it and rebel against me. That's why there's no healing. But you could have healing. We look for peace and there is no good for a time of healing and behold trouble. You only look for peace because it's so chaotic. The way to peace is for you to return to me. You look for healing and there's only trouble. You have trouble because you won't come to me. If you will return to me, you will have healing. You will have peace. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God's telling them the same thing there. He's been telling them for 13 chapters. Come on, come to me. You'll be okay. Jeremiah knows the answers to these questions, but he's crying and pleading, why, why, why? God's been telling him why, and then Jeremiah's been telling the people why. But Jeremiah is but flesh, and he is weak too, and he does not want to see this destruction come upon this place. It's like me. I am begging you to see the parallels between then and there. I want you to see that we're going to hell in a handbasket, I don't want you to go with it. Return to the Lord your God. If you never belong to him, come to him today. All you have to do is believe that Jesus suffered and died for your sins, that he was crucified according to the scriptures, that he was buried dead, 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 and buried, taken down dead from the cross and buried. And then he rose the third day according to the scriptures. He's alive then, he's alive now, he's alive forever. He's coming back to join, to judge the quick and the dead. Put your trust and your faith in him and him alone, and you shall be saved. That's not just New Testament and the Old Testament. God says through Isaiah, Come unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. Anybody who will come to me, I will save you. But you can't come to a false me and you can't come to somebody you think you'd like me to be you have to come to me God said in verse 20 Jeremiah says we acknowledge O Lord our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers for we have sinned against thee well that's good <laughs> Jeremiah knew why God was judging him God had told Jeremiah Jeremiah had told the people God also told Jeremiah not to pray for this people anymore, to stop praying for them, that he was going to destroy them.
Well, now Jeremiah, in a way, is disobeying God. He's praying for those people. Can't help it. He's one of the people. So he's praying for the people. They're flesh. They're not God. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. In other words, don't hate us because for your very own name's sake, you need to love us because you took us to be your people. To protect the honor of your name, you need to keep loving us, God. You can't hate us because we're your people. We're your, we're your heritage. If you hate us, Lord, if you hate us, it'll look bad on you. It'll look bad on your name. All the heathen round about us, they'll go, wow, God promised those people everything and then he stomps them. We don't want people to think that, Lord. For your own name's sake, love us. For your own name's sake, do not destroy us. He says, do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. There would be innocent blood among the blood of the, the wicked on the altar. Good morning, Charlie. Jeremiah says, God, don't hate us because of your name. You promised to love us. You've taken us out as a people. If if you hate us, you will disgrace your throne. You will you will make your glory less. Not to me, Lord, but to all the heathen round about to see you acting. So why is God killing his own people? He must be a really weird God. First he saves them out of Egypt. He preserves them to this day, and now he's destroying them. Jeremiah is saying, hey, God is going to make you look bad. If you do this to us, remember, remember us, remember the covenant. And he says, break not thy covenant with us. Well, Jeremiah in the flesh, it's kind of hard to tell whether he's asking this question for himself or if he's asking them to know what to say to people, or if he's gone back to doing what God told him not to do, which is to pray for the people. God told him, don't pray for this bunch of people anymore because I am going to destroy them. And the ones I don't destroy, I'm going to remove out of my sight. I'm going to remove them from each place and carry them far away to Babylon. Jeremiah says, remember, break not thy covenant with us. Well, here in a little while, he promises to save a remnant. He's going to save a remnant land in the land. He's going to bring back a remnant from captivity. It's all outlined later in this chapter. You got to, you got to remember. Good morning, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. You got to remember that, uh, God always preserves a remnant and that anybody who comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. He won't turn anybody away. He's already told the people of Judah and Jerusalem especially that if you just return to me, I'll protect your life, but I'm going to judge this place. I explained yesterday why, or day before yesterday, I explained why, uh, he was removing them from the land because they had broke the covenant of the land. They had not left the ground lay fallow every seventh year. They had been there for 490 years. So they were going to go into 70 years of captivity so there could be a year for every year that the land should have been laid fallow and been renewed in a Sabbath unto the Lord. That was part of it. They broke the covenant with God. Jeremiah says, don't break your covenant with us. Remember your covenant. Well, he did remember. 
and he remembered every time they broke it. He let a lot of things slide for a lot of years. He let some adultery slide. He let some fornication slide. He let murder slide. He let greed slide. He let false witness slide. There was never a good king in Israel, but in Judah there were several good kings, godly kings. And when a godly king was in power, God blessed him. And he was never perfect because he was the king. <laughs> kings, kings get selfish in there, but what they say goes, you know. Oh, you, you know. Uh, the executioner walks behind him with a sharp sword. That's what that was old Abishai's job. He let a lot of stuff slide, but as I've explained, it got to the point where there have been several evil kings. Then Josiah came along. He was the last good king. There was nothing but evil in the land. And he had let things go for a long time. But the sin had washed up over their head finally. They were flooding. When he floods them out of the land, they will flow away. On a tide of sin, the current will carry them away. A riptide from which they cannot escape. He let it go for a long time, remembering the covenant. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. He let it go for a long time while they broke it. And finally, their idolatry, their worshiping other gods, their spiritual adultery, he couldn't stand it anymore. You'll notice he didn't judge them for wife stealing and, and uh, fornication and, and adultery and orgies and stuff like that, which were certainly going on because he complains about them being like, Freshly fed horses neighing at their neighbors' wives, and that their fornications and adulteries were just too many to number. But it was the spiritual fornication, idolatry, that made him judgment. It became too much, it became too great, and he would not stand it anymore. The other thing he would not stand was the sacrificing of their children to Molech. The third thing was believing the lies of the priests and the prophets whom he had not sent. They were just making it up, telling people what they wanted to hear, just like now. So, it's not so much that God is breaking his covenant with them. They had already broken their covenant with him. And unlike the covenant with Abraham and with David, the Mosaic covenant and the covenant of the land were conditional. Not ownership of the land, but he says, I'll remove you from the land if you start acting like the people who acted like before you came. If you start acting like the ones I drove out before you, then I'll do the same thing to you. That's the covenant of the land. Well, later in Jeremiah, he's going to promise to bring them back after 70 years, but the people don't know that then. Jeremiah doesn't know that then. Only God knows at this point. Jeremiah continues his plea. And he says, are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? You, you know, Jeremiah is praising him. You're the only God there is. The gods of the Gentiles, they can't cause rain. All these other gods surrounding us, they can't cause rain. The gods who were in the land before we were here, they can't cause rain. Or can the heavens give showers? No. 
Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Aren't you the only one who can do that? They can bring rain in its due season. Do what you need to do. Control nature. Therefore, we will wait upon thee. And this is worship. Kevin, good morning. We will wait upon thee. And it goes beyond serving him. Because Jeremiah knows that they're not going to serve him. The nation isn't. But the handful of people who are returning to God said, we'll wait and see what you're going to do. Because you made all these things. And you keep them going. And you can do whatever thing you want to do, oh Lord. So Jeremiah starts out crying and praying for the people, which God told him not to do anymore. And he's begging God not really to change his mind, but for further explanation, like how can you do this to us if we're your people? On some level, Jeremiah knows, but maybe he's looking for something else he can tell the people. And tomorrow, Jeremiah will get his wish because Jeremiah is going to explain to him uh, God is going to explain to Jeremiah exactly why this judgment is coming upon Judah and why. He's already told them before why, but it'll be God's own actual explanation on why he won't turn back, why he won't lift his hand and ease up on it. See, Jeremiah has asked questions that he knows the answers to. He knows that God hasn't rejected Judah. He knows that he doesn't utterly loathe Zion. Now, he's smitten us, and he, he does question why there's no healing, but he knows that there is healing. There is healing for those who return to him, individuals, not the land, not the kingdom. We look for peace, but there is no good. You can have peace if you return to me, God has said. We look for a time of healing and behold trouble. You can have healing if you return to me, God said. Same thing now. You can have all those things if you come to Jesus. Then Jeremiah goes to confession. He's confessing our sin. Their sin says, we know our wickedness, the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Not just our fathers. We're not blaming it all on them, but us, we, and Jeremiah includes himself because he's flesh too. We've all sinned against, sinned against you. But just because we sinned against you, don't hate us. Don't, don't do anything to hurt your name. But see, there comes a time when God's name gets hurt by not judging. Because he cannot be a just God and not judge sin. And here are the people who are called by his own name who have refused to worship him and are worshiping other gods and are sacrificing their children or believing lying prophets until it's come to the point where he's got to do something about it. He's not going to wait any longer. He has to perform justice. He would not be acting in his own character. It would be against God's justice, against his character, not to bring justice. He is a just and faithful God. See, the reason that he is able to save us and forgive us our sins is because Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, came as a man and lived in the perfect life and, 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 and never sinned. And then when he was crucified on the cross, his blood paid for our sins. It was the innocent dying for the guilty because only by the blood of the Son of God could man be saved. We cannot save ourselves. So what get God did was on his own son. He put my sin. He put your sin. He judged the entire world for the sins of the world. He, he judged Jesus Christ 
because of Jimmy Harris's sin and because of your sin and because of everybody else's sin. And he took the sin of the world upon him. The scripture says, for he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What happens on the cross is that God judged Jimmy on the cross. Jesus took my judgment. So that if I believe in Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, the risen Christ who is alive today, if I believe in him and trust him, then God says justice has been served. I don't have to judge any Jimmy anymore because I judged his sin in Jesus on the cross. What happened on the cross is that Jesus took my sin and wrapped himself in it, the sins of the whole world. And those sins were judged when God judged Jesus on the cross. What happens when I believe in the atonement? When I believe the gospel and when I trust in Christ, Jesus takes his own righteousness where my sin that he paid for used to be and he puts it around me like a robe of righteousness and covers me up in his righteousness. So when God looks at Jimmy, I'm not a criminal anymore. I'm not a criminal anymore who needs to stand trial, needs to have judgment. I've already had judgment. I've already been cleared. Not only that, when God looks at me, he doesn't even look at me or my past sins. All he sees is the shed blood of Jesus, and he sees me clothed in Jesus' righteousness. For he was made to be for he made it for he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the remedy for you now. But on this national scale, and that was the remedy for them then, anyone who returned to God, he would protect any individual. But the judgment of the nation was coming, and he had to judge the nation, or he would not be a just judge, a just God. It fulfilled his character to judge the wicked. And <laughs> his own people, Judah and Jerusalem, they had become had more wicked than anybody else around them. God tells them that. Again, in Second Chronicles, we read the, the most concise description of why he had to destroy Jerusalem through Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Second Corinthians 36, 24, uh, 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, the temple. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, Nebuchadnezzar. When judgment comes, it's because there is no other remedy. Judgment has fallen on this land because there is no other remedy. They talk about draining the swamps. It's not even a question of draining the swamp anymore. You got to flush the toilet. <laughs> and that's what God is doing to us. Come to him today. Don't wait. Be in a hurry, like the, like the Mad Hatter, the, the rabbit, you know, the rabbit, you know, the, the mad, yeah, yeah, the Mad Hatter. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. No time to talk, no time to wait. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Well, you're late, brother. If you don't know him, come to him today. Tomorrow we will start 
the conclusion of the message on the drought and why the drought has come, followed by the famine and the pestilence, and soon to be followed by the sword upon Judah and Jerusalem. And God will, as I promised, he will make a more succinct and detailed explanation of why he is judging his own people in such a harsh way and in such a bad time. God love you. Thanks for your prayers.